So let's talk about song a little bit. <laughs> because you're doing an opera. Yeah. Because lip sync was based on this aria. Yeah. Um, and it is a controlled screen. Yeah. About what? Does a con controlled screen express more of who we are as humans than ideas in words? I think it's a question of... Um a controlled scream, is, for me, is a metaphor of what art in general should be. Uh, I don't want to name drop, but uh, I've met Issey Miyake a few times uh, in Japan. He's this great designer who obviously I have not started to design what I'm wearing on today. <laughs> but he's, you know, he's, he's like nice. I like it. World, uh, fashion designer and all that. He's the best. He's Japanese and uh, and he's known for all the pleating. He, he did all this kind of pleating thing and. and uh, wrinkle. He, he, you buy a shirt at Isemiyake, and they take the shirt and they, they don't, they don't fold it for you in a nice bag. I think they, they do a knot in it so to make sure that it stays wrinkled, and they put it in the back. So anyway, so he, he revolutionized uh, our way of seeing wrinkles, <laughs> but also the the the, the uh, fashion. In general. So so I'm a great 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 fan of it. And I did a show about Hiroshima called the Seven Streams of the River Uta, and we played it in Tokyo. And it was the year of the 50th anniversary of uh, the bombing of Hiroshima. And Semiyaki came to the show and he uh, joined one of the many intervals, because it was a seven hour show, so there was many intervals, and, and came and met us. And you know, it was really nice to get to meet him and we talked. And he said, I really like what you're doing with, with the whole Hiroshima thing, because he says, you're doing art, you're, doing, you're, you're, you're extracting beauty out of this thing. He said, I never mentioned this to the press or to anybody, but he says, I'm a Nibakusha, Nibakusha is a victim of the bomb. He was seven, and he was, you know, he was raised in Hiroshima, and at seven he was, uh, wow. he saw the bomb, you know, he was there, the bomb fell on, on, on him and his family and his house and all that, and he was, and Ise Miyake limps a bit, people don't, if you look carefully, he has a little limp, so he, he was wounded by, he, he's a victim of the bomb, and we don't know to what extent, but he's a victim of the bomb, and he said, I chose to not to, to be bitter about this and not to, to um, express the horror of this, but express the, not the beauty of it, because it's not a beautiful thing, but express the beauty that can, it's a very Buddhist uh, way of thinking. And he said, I'll send you uh, some books, because Irving Penn took pictures of uh, all of his collections for a while. So he sent, he sent me in Quebec City uh, a pile of maybe five or six books of each year's collection. And you look at all the pleating and all of the wrinkling and all that, and it's really his vision of seeing women with, with burned skin Cars. coming off of their bodies. And you know, it's really what it was and how he changed that into beautiful uh, evening gowns and, and Nancy Regan wearing the skins of the Hiroshima victims on her without knowing. You know, I mean, it's, it's a horrible way of putting it, but what I mean is that he squeeze the beauty out of this thing. And, and uh, that for me is controlled screaming. It's that you spend your life screaming this thing that happened to you, but you've, you've polished it and you've, you've, you have a sense of, of you present it with taste, you, you make it resonate in a different way. You don't annoy people with it, you don't bore people with it, you make it shine. And that's controlled screaming. Then why speak at all? For example, the first scene in Lip Sync, yeah. I was, I didn't want to hear anymore. I didn't want to see anymore. I was so full. Mm -hmm. I had gone on such a journey. I had felt so much. W why go to words at all then? Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's also because th there's, there's, you know, I believe in, in counterpoint. And it's always, I always use these musical references, uh, but I guess they're probably not there by chance. Is that you need after that opening scene where it's very operatic and very symphonic and larger than life and everything that happens there is so such you you know this woman dies on the plane of her baby crying and somebody picks up it's this huge thing that can in the worst environment possible and then after that you have somebody who tries to get a mess a phone message through to yeah. the, the whole Lufthansa uh, system and, and it's just the funniest kookiest Right. stupidest thing you can do after such tragedy. And that for me is a real sense of counterpoint. 
suddenly people are drawn in. They don't only get a, a comic relief, but they they get a chance very early on in this nine hours of storytelling to see that we're not just going to be uh, pushing it, uh, hitting it on the head. That we're actually going to be offering them different doors to enter the same the same uh, room and. and uh, some people are not moved by comedy or, or not, uh, let's say, touched or stimulated like by Putting comedy. the coffin in the... Yeah, yeah. Right, sliding the coffin. <laughs> some people, some people would just step just into anything for them. But there's some people who are completely turned off by anything that's too heavy or graphic or... Uh, right. They don't, they, you know. So, so you they mean... They offer different doors, and, and, but at the end, everybody kind of meets in the same room. So to speak to many audiences, you use this thing, kind of or, or, or it's a way also for because there's one of the because I do a lot of creation. So uh, the biggest enemy uh, when you when you you take somebody else's play and if it's a good play, you chances are all of the redundancy have been evacuated. If it's a good play, it's well written and it's not redundant. But when you do creation, it takes a while before you're not redundant. You're, you say it over and over and over and over. So. So a play is, in order to get the message across and, and for things to be clear, you have to be redundant, but you have to find a way so that it doesn't show. So you present it in a tragical way, you present it in a funny way, you explain the little facets of it that maybe people didn't get in another way. So the things that you're just kind of always going over the same thing, but you just have to, there has to be um, stuff there for anybody to grab. Or anybody to and also, that's probably one of the reasons why I work with so many different actors from different parts of the world, and, and my shows are in many languages, is that, you know, people have different... Uh, but from what I've seen, you're interested in the minutia, trying to get the message through the Lufthansa, and how that reflects yeah. people, humanity, frustrations. The large scale, the aria, and the death. In the middle, you don't go there a lot. No. Where the normal plays are. Yeah. You don't go there a lot. Your strength is not only the, m the tiny observed moment that you will place on a huge stage or in a frame, but you observe that moment. Mm -hmm. um, that's the part of the uniqueness of what you do, mm -hmm. as well as reaching for yeah. the earned moment. I, mean, this, this, uh, I think that whatever you try to say or you try to convey, um, there's, there's two stories. In French, the word histoire means two things. It means story, but also means history. So we say uh, histoire with a small age and histoire with a big age. There's a small story and there's the big story. Your ages were good. My ages were good. <laughs> but in French, you, can, you don't pronounce them. <laughs> See, yet another letter that's completely anyway. And they're not going to take it out. But that's French, I think. Sorry. Small H and big H yeah, as so well. Yeah, so the small H and the big H. So meaning the, uh, history in a big sense and history in a very, very tiny sense. And one is the echo of the other, whatever you do. So when I did Far Side of the Moon, for example, it's a huge theme, the theme of reconciliation, reconciliation at a universal level, uh, the Americans with the Russians at the time and, and, and uh, the Western world and uh, the values of the East and, and, and French Canadians and English Canadians, you know, all this theme of, of reconciliation is a huge theme to approach. And you cannot have the pretension to say that you have the answer to Jews and Arabs. And you, know, you, can, you can't. The only thing you're sure of is your experience. And your experience often is a small history. It's you and your brother when you were eight years old and he was 12 and you shared the same room. And there was a bookshelf that separated the room in two and he had his territory and you had your territory and you got in conflict for the most trivial things, right? That you can tell. That you know intimately. So instead of saying, okay, so what is this about? Oh, this is about the conflict between Israel and Palestine. Don't start there. Get there at the end. Start what you know. What do you know? What you know is what you've been through. It's your story. It's your little local thing. You do that, and you, if you have some kind of universal consciousness, the rest will come out. So when I did Far Side of the Moon, it's a very, very trivial thing about two brothers, the mother dies, the father's been dead a long time ago, 
they don't even have a will to share, you know, there's nothing left, and so what do they, so now they have to reconcile, you know, reconcile on what basis, and it's a very, very, like, almost soapy story of a, a brother who made it, and who's annoying, and a brother who's too, has too much integrity to make it, and it's very, very, but there's something in the past of one of the characters, which is his fascination for space and all that, that brings that little conflict onto a bigger scale, when there was a, a space race, when the world and was divided into two ways of seeing the world, and, and how do you get them to reconcile that. So when I did The Far Side of the Moon, I, surpri I was surprised to see that my little personal story had all of that connected to it. And it was reinforced, that feeling was reinforced when I started touring around the world, and you go to places like Korea, you, 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 you know, you're playing Korea, and what that means to have two brothers who share the same territory, where there's a bookshelf that separates, and they, 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 they don't get along, but they feel connected mm -hmm. at every level, except they can't. And mm -hmm. So for them, it was a big thing. So you, you, you have to let people inform you of what your work is about. You don't know what it's all about. And Michel Tremblay, and I was kind of quote, quote, for Michel, I paraphrased him. I paraphrased him so many times, I'm sure that probably didn't even say any of this. So I just kind of, but uh, you know, Michel Tremblay once said, uh, in, in, uh, sometime in the 80s, and it really kind of struck me, said, uh, today, today um, the people in theater in Montreal are trying to be international. Uh, they write an in, in international French, and they have international ideas, and they want their, they want to tour internationally, and they want to be published internationally. And that. So they write things that are international, that cannot be uh, cornered in one part of the world. It's something that happens everywhere in the world. And he says, of course, it doesn't reach nobody. Nobody's interested. It's bland. It's of no interest. He said, people have to try to be universal. The best way to be universal is to talk about what goes on in your bedroom and in your mm -hmm. kitchen and in your little community. Talk about that. And chances are people in another part of the world, whether they're religion or the culture, they land into it. They okay. know what that is about. But this That's brings another question. subject to the table. Yeah. To talk about the two brothers, to talk about mm -hmm. the local, you have to be confident. You have to have a confidence of, of an artist. If you're not confident, mm -hmm. you'll feel you have to reach. Yeah. And where did, where did the confidence come from in you? How did you find that? Well, I think it, it, comes from, it came from the, 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 uh, the lack of confidence in the sense that it comes from the fact that I never had the pretension of... I, I was born a loser and I've always been a loser, so I never had any ambition. No, really, I never had any ambition to do what, what, whatever. I just was interested in theater and did my thing and never thought... Right. never had the pretension that it would uh, right. take off or that people would identify to it or that would become what it become. And and, uh, and this is not false humility, really. That's what I thought. And I was brought up in a, in a, in a family that thought that way. That you know, my father was a taxi driver, and he always said to us, "Never try to be bigger than what you are. You will never be bigger than you are. You know, were born like this, and that's it. And you stay." And I've always kind of accepted that to a point where it didn't. Um, I, I because I'm not. I'm a very shy person. I'm a very um, uh, what can I say reserved person. I mean, you're very careful. Very, I'm very careful. You're placed. You're yeah, careful. Absolutely. But so that, I don't, so I don't that's also a strength in your work as well, right? Uh, it's, it's, it's the care with which you observe, the care with which you, as you say, yeah. you sit on the terrace and I hear the conversations, yeah. the care that you don't listen, the care that you do listen. It's that which uh, gives a, an authority and a, an integrity yeah. to but whatever the, you're doing, whether it's too long or too short, we love it or, or I don't know, we're fascinated. Yeah. But the authority is, it doesn't come from... Uh, I don't mean strength authority, I mean you know, authenticity. Yeah, authenticity maybe, more than authority. Because um, I, I'm not sure of anything that I do. I mean, I'm, I'm in constant doubt, and I always have the impression that, you know, this is going to be it, this is when people are going to stop. But I, this is what I think we should be doing, and the people around me who, to whom I'm devising this are... They don't necessarily agree, but they try, and they try to make it work, and we just kind of do our thing. And, and, and But we know that the audience, the, the real work will happen when the audience sees it, the audience tells you, whoa, or this doesn't work, or wait a minute, there's more to it than you think, or, or this is much clearer than you think. Stop uh, trying to make it clearer. It is clear, and, and then suddenly the audience tells you what your work's about, and they're the ones who, and, and that's so, the uh, confidence that I have. I have confidence 
in the process and have confidence in in uh, in, in, in the process of, of not just writing in a collective way but sharing it with the audience.